Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Darcy Davis. I am the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, April 9th, and we will hear the presentation, Architecture and Urban Planning in West Africa and South America. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the GoToWebinar tool panel. And for your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in the chat box in your GoToWebinar tool panel. We will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Uh, it would help me out greatly if you could list who you want to answer the question. Um, that just eliminates some of the extra time that I have to take to figure that out. So thank you for that ahead of time. Uh, coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2021. Thanks to all of those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, we are sponsored jointly by the APA uh, National Capital Area Chapter and the APA International Division. So thanks to both of you for pulling this session together and having it ready for us today. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. We are actually booked through June. We're just getting the final pieces together to start registration. Uh, so be sure to head over to our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And there you can register for all of our upcoming sessions. Today's session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. Just head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And make sure you like us on Facebook, just search planning webcast series and we'll pop up. That's where I post any important information such as date or time changes. And when I have new sessions that are available for you to register for, that's where I post those types of announcements. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. We record all of our sessions and post them up there. By subscribing, you'll get notified when we have new sessions available for you to view. So please join. Uh, me and my 3,000 or so friends who have subscribed to our channel already, uh, we appreciate that. I think that's it for my housekeeping items. Uh, again, if you have questions, type them in that chat box. We'll get to those at the end during the Q&A. And now I am going to turn it over to Mark, who will give a introduction. Mark, I just turned those controls over to you. Thank you, Christine. Um, let me pull up my PowerPoint. Can everyone see this? Looks perfect. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Again, my name is Mark Lewis T. Grace. I'm the Professional Development Officer for the National Capital Area Chapter which encompasses Washington, D.C., along with Montgomery and Prince George's counties in suburban Maryland. And again, as Christine said, the uh, APA International Division is also co-sponsoring this. So um, thank you to them for co-sponsoring this as well. And a slight update from the slides you saw originally. This is uh, architecture and urban planning in uh, Southeast Asia. We were able to add a third speaker, South America and East Africa. And I just wanted to give you a quick um, intro to each of the three speakers and they'll go more into their qualifications shortly. Um, we're gonna start off with uh, Hong Edulantes. Um, she's a urban planning student at the University of Maryland College Park. She is a native of Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and she's particularly interested in the intersection of real estate planning and community development. And she'll talk about um, urban planning history in Vietnam. We have Roberto Mores uh, Iturieta, who's a professor at the Institute of Urban Studies at the Pontifical Catholic University in Chile. He's based in Santiago, Chile. We'll talk about urban planning and urban planning history in Chile and Santiago specifically. And um, last but not least, we have Garth Myers, 
He is a professor with the Center for Urban and Global Studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and he's going to talk about his research in Nairobi, Kenya, and Anglophone East uh, East Africa. So with that, I will um, hand over the controls to Hong, and uh, give me one second. Um, and Hong, I believe the controls are yours. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Can everybody still see and hear me? Um, I'm seeing a white screen now. We can see you and hear you, but we're just seeing a white screen. Okay. Um, what about now? Mm, same thing. Oh, now we see. Um, okay, you can see this. You, uh, yes. All right. Um, let me move. If anything, you can always just kind of maximize. Um, you know, this always happens. We do a test and it works great. And then <laughs> and we do it for real. It doesn't. Okay, but you can see the screen moving, right? Yes. Okay, so. Um, all right, we can I can get started. Oh. Hi. I'm gonna turn, should I turn on my webcam? Um, no, you can turn it off just so that we can see the whole screen. Watch it. Well, uh, thank you, Mark and Christine, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in today and taking some time out of your Friday afternoon to listen in to our stories. And uh, personally, for me, this is such an incredible honor for me to be able to share my experience growing up in, in Vietnam and also just to tell the story of Vietnam that might not necessarily have always been told aside from the narrative of the Vietnam War, which I have encountered um, while I was living in America for a, a brief while. And so today I'll be your virtual tour guide and uh, we'll take you on a tour about um, history of planning and what modernizing Vietnam looks like. So for our itinerary, we'll start with uh, a brief history and then we'll visit the different region in Vietnam, explore the regionality of each places and how that has implications for planning. Then we'll take a look at um, early land reforms or early planning in the new um, uh, government of Vietnam. And then we'll explore what modern planning in Vietnam looks like. And then we explore the major forces that is shaping how planning is done in Vietnam at the moment. Then we'll stop by Ho Chi Minh City, uh, my hometown. I'll give you a little bit of a tour there. And then we'll end by visiting some of the street vendors and explore that as a case study into implications of planning um, that we have right now. So a brief history, Vietnam prior to uh, colonization was mainly an agrarian society. And so um, most, majority of the people were farmers and then the king was the head of state. So it's uh, pretty simple in terms of the political setup there. And then by the time colonization happened, we see um, early infrastructure investment and development happening throughout um, the different major parts of the country. So we have more roads building, more bridges building, um, and some of the mechanica, mechanic, mechanicalized uh, investment happening as well. Then post-colonialism, uh, during the early independence period, Vietnam was in a transitioning period into understanding um, what is really our ideology, what sort of government, what sort of country do we want ourselves to be? And so you have 
um, you might be familiar during this period as the Vietnam War, when you have the, uh, the division between the North and the South Vietnam because of this ideology on how um, you know, the country should be governed. And so planning during this post-independence um, time was really about what, what do we want ourselves to be and answering that big question. Then after the Communist Party took over um, and reunification happened in 1975, um, we start seeing the early um, steps of modernization. And so the first big step that uh, I would cite it as um, the early planning plan was the economic reform, the OMI. And since then, we see the country just took off exponentially in terms of modernization and, 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 and development. Um, so in, in the big picture, planning really looks like modernization for in terms of the Vietnamese context. And what that can look like is there's a lot of rapid industrialization happening. Um, you see rapid urbanization happening throughout the country. Uh, because of um, the influence of the global forces, the internationalization and efforts to make foreign investment attractive is also a big part of the planning agenda. And comes along with that is also a big push for preservation in terms of culture, identity, and natural resource as well. So here's the different regions of Vietnam. The map you see is actually taken from a business foreign investment consulting firm in Vietnam uh, outlining like the different key economic region. You can see it's organized by North, Central and South. And so in terms of the master planning of the whole country, usually it's focused regionally um, for the country. Aside from social economic planning, um, implications for the cultural uh, differences is also uh, something that we need to take into account because um, even if the country is small, there's such a variety of the local culture and identity and the, um, the, the resources available um, within the part, different parts of the country as well. So as you can see here, um, this is for um, images typical of the central region. Um, and so planning tends to focus a lot on um, natural disaster mitigation around here. And the Mekong Delta is also a big center for the geopolitical planning that because it has um, connections to other neighboring countries as well. So we'll transition to the early land reforms. Uh, so early land reforms or early planning um, within the new government um, really looks like redistribution of land uh, because, as I said earlier, feudal Vietnam farmers did not own land; it's owned by the the the, the state and the the landlords uh, actually. But after independence, um, you have two different government system that wants to reform land. Um, the North focused more on the co-op own style versus and the Southern government wanted to um, have individual household ownership. And so because of that clash of uh, one of the reason, so, but that is a big reason, because of that clash, you see during this time, the uh, part of the D Vietnamese diaspora started happening and it intensified after um, the Communist Party took over in 1975. So after 1975 and until the economic reform happening in 1986, um, that's a period of experimentation for the new government. And um, it's not always have been the most um, celebratory period in the Vietnam history. We have, during those time, um, extreme poverty was happening uh, and, um, and, and people weren't really happy. Um, and, and during those time until the present, the government has taken learned a lot of lessons and make um, land reform more um, appropriate for the modern day needs. So what does modern planning look like in Vietnam? 
from my experience uh, being a student of urban planning in the United States context, I've seen majority of the planning is state, county, very, even local specific. And so it, it's hard to have a very efficient system in my opinion. But in terms of planning in Vietnam, if you can see this chart here, you have the different ministry um, guided by the master plan voted every five years by National Assembly. And then you have the, the, the different um, agency um, or local agency underneath and that focus on that. And so whenever a new initiatives or agenda start, was passed, you see very quickly how it's being implemented within five, within the five years. And so the master plan um, is a, a, a huge part of what planning, how planning is done in Vietnam. And then coupled with that, this is the different characteristic of what it looks like, uh, m more invest, more foreign investment and, and more capital intensive investment um, is driven by real estate, especially industrial zones, um, new plans are being made throughout the country. Tourism and cultural preservation, as I said earlier, of what um, that preservation aspect is also a big part of, of the agenda. And then transportation is becoming increasingly important, especially in dense urban core. And we'll see some of that when we talk, take a look at Ho Chi Minh City. And because Vietnam is situated in a way where you have the, the, the Pacific Ocean and you have China, in the north and you have the all the other southeast asian neighboring countries planning to be in a favorable geopolitics position is also very um essential in the master plan and so uh, taking all of this uh in mind like you can see the country is like very focused and you know you have very clear direction on how the country wants to be transformed and organized a brief look at the major forces that are shaping Vietnam's modernization. The government is for sure the one of the major forces that um, is shaping, and you have the centralized government who, have, who meet at the National Assembly um, and voted on the five years plan. And then, then you also have becoming more, uh, the local government is becoming more, uh, given more autonomy in terms of how planning is done. Parti this is particularly true in dense urban centers such as Ho Chi Minh City, Hanoi, and Da Nang. Uh, foreign investor is also a big uh, player in Vietnam's modernization. Viet overseas Vietnamese um, have been credited to uh, be, do a lot of investments and corporate building and capital intensive projects in Vietnam as well. There is actually a big uh, a, a, a agenda and initiative to attract overseas Vietnamese. Um, different corporations, uh, if you know, if you go, if you see a lot of uh, manu uh, clothing manufacturing, shoes manufacturing companies, you see made in Vietnam, um, that's a big portion to shaping how the different industrialization is happening. And the different international development agency like the USAID, um, the World Bank is also a huge player in just shaping how policy is done in terms of visioning and organization and structure. And lastly, I think it's not as talked about is the informal economy, um, the, your, your regular private citizens, um, householders, artists, and, and entrepreneurs, this informal economy is still very strong uh, in Vietnam and and as you can see uh, later when we visit Ho Chi Minh City how that might have played out. So Ho Chi Minh City has always been a center of commerce and a leader in internationalization. I grew up uh, in the city, I was born in um, 1996 and I still remember just seeing a flat landscape and, and, and growing up seeing a bunch of skyscrapers and just the, the whole, as I grew up in the modernized um, world, like I, I've, I've seen, I've witnessed, I've grown through with the city. And so it, you can't help but not feel that energy um, living in, in such one of the big city in the world. Um, so as the country is growing so rapidly, 
uh, more of the more of the recent planning is focusing on how to make this urban core less dense. And so we see uh, starting to see more formation of the satellite city or urban fringes. So this um, map over here is of a, a new plan community. It's called the Saigon South Master Plan. And actually, this is where a lot of um, the expats are living. You see a lot of the international schools. Um, this plan was actually commissioned by, by a, a U, U.S. firm. Um, so that's an inter interesting aspect of that. Um, as opposed to, you know, the more um, real estate driven uh, project, you have more people, individual people driving their, their own um, modernization. So as the country grows more prosperous, people income increase, and usually those wealth is being put back into the community. Um, as you can see over here, this is a typical uh, house that must have been uh, here for 10, 20 years. And then when families income increase, people is you know, invest in and rebuild. And you see this happening throughout the, the whole city and even like different parts of the country. So wealth is usually being regenerated into the neighborhoods. Um, whereas contrast into the United States, you've seen a lot of, because of real estate developer driven, you know, wealth is usually um, not being reinvested back into the communities we're living in here. So I thought that was a really interesting contrast. Um, and also technologically, um, planning as a field is evolving very rapidly. So this um, this map over here is the GIS um, power platform where you can learn about the, the different zoning and lots type. And this wasn't uh, available um, three years ago. So just the technology that's been available and the people adapting to it is incredible. So I want to end just talking about my 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 personal um, concerns or interests, as you could say, about street food vendors. So if you've had an opportunity to vi visit Vietnam, um, going to out on the street food, no matter which region you are in, is is part of the cultural experience. Um, however, as uh, the urban uh, urbanization is happening so rapidly, and you see um, more projects driven, um, there's been a push to rezone a lot of this um, establishments. And most of these people, you know, um, are, are, are people who might may migrate from the less um, wealthy countryside and making a, uh, making a living in the country. So for, for me personally, when looking at this, I think this is such a cool cultural component at the same time I, we can't ignore that people move to the, the the city to sell this food because of the lack of uh, social economic incentive back in their hometown and so how do we how do we plan and how do we balance it in a way that preserve that that autonomy of people make for themselves and as well the food system as you can see here, this lady probably has been live, um, selling in this neighborhood market for years. Every neighborhood you would go into, you see local vendors like this. But as supermarkets become more and more popular, um, vendors like her can de be deemed unsanitary. Uh, and so that's have some different implications for public health as well. And so in conclusion, planning uh, as an industry is very forward looking at the moment. Um, it's highly efficient due to the nature, due to the way this government is structured. Um, but like any government, um, and, and there's pros and cons. There's can be a lack of public accountability in the way, um, you know, projects, money, funds is being transferred. And so there's a lot of talk about um, like corruption within the government as well. If you happen to talk to the local, they can tell you all about that. And uh, some of the challenges that is coming with modernization is that wealth and service gap is becoming increasingly clear. Um, you know, people in the uh, city are definitely more wealthier than people who live uh, more on the rural community. And then there are challenges with environmental issues as well. Um, 
pollutions, air pollution is a huge part in the city. And as the country is also trying to grapple with the infinite of the uh, climate change. And then the, another issue is culture and identity. Um, how are we, who are we that continues to be uh, come up uh, as a, a nation and a culture? And that is um, what I think planning is become, becoming and evolving to be. And that would be the end of my talk. Let me... Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you and we can see your presentation. Ah, great, great. Um, bueno, thank you very much for this invitation to Mark and Christine. I will show you just a few ideas about um, the how history uh, has been involved, um, defi finally defini defining our our uh, uh, cities. Um, I will um, want to start with this image from the siege of the um, uh, Catholic uh, kings in 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 Spain. In 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 can can you can you see it in in 1492? And and here is a is a very important moment um for um the catholic the catholic church but also when in the same time um was uh, when um christopher columbus was negotiating with the um uh, elizabeth um about the 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 trip to america um and we imagine these um these uh, conversations in a kind of uh, palace, but the, the the truth that these um, capitulations, these negotiations, were in a camp because the the kings they were attacking Granada and was uh, uh, in this situation was in the camp, and this camp is um, is is still there. It's a it's a small town. Um, located 30 minutes um, to Granada, and this camp um, is, uh, you can see the structure of this camp uh, with uh, a central square with four um, gates, and, and this uh, small camp was used as a guideline for um, the new cities in America. And this is, is very interesting for us because uh, we, as our planners and architects, we are trained that the, the American cities are following the Roman uh, rules, and, but it's very difficult for us to recognize these cities in Europe. And, uh, but this is uh, like the origin of the old American, especially South American uh, cities. Um, you can see how uh, Santiago, uh, 50 years later, was founded following the same rules. And it's very interesting for us to see how this tiny town next to Granada is a, is a main reference uh, for our cities. Um, another uh, big jump to, for, for, for the, 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 our influences is also related with the industrial cities. Um, as you know, um, in Europe, especially in England, uh, industrial cities was uh, um, the, the, it, it means the integrate um, the movement of uh, um, agricultural workers to cities and they were concentrated creating 
a completely new scale of cities with um, something that uh, we didn't know before. Um, we moved the the traditional um, the traditions for, of workers to, from the rural area to cities um, with uh, children working in, in, in industries and without any kind of uh, human rights. We, we, we didn't know about the human rights in that moment and, and that um, conditions uh, showed uh, uh, cities with different um, situations, uh, central cities with a lot of movement, a lot of energy, new infrastructures, but at the same time, the living condition of workers were very bad, uh, very unequal, and, and in, in cities like Santiago was almost the same, um, very bad conditions for workers, but at the same time, some uh, the central, uh, the, 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 the downtowns were uh, quite elegant, you know? That kind of living conditions um, they were in, in, in England um, demonstrated uh, with uh, important surveys like this, you know, they were showing the real situation. But this is the, the condition, of, uh, the living condition of people were hidden, you know, the, 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 the elite, they didn't really interact with these uh, workers. Um, and even there were some important uh, um, researchers like uh, Engels, they were showing the situation several years before. Um, um, several decades happened until um, 1883 with uh, the, this uh, pamphlet of uh, Reverend uh, Andrew Mears about the conditions that uh, these people were living. I think it, uh, uh, it was very important because um, is this uh, uh, pamphlet is, is, is talking about the bad condition of people, but at the same time is creating this situation that is not, we sh as a society, we should be worried about these people, not just because they are living in bad conditions and we should be worried for them, it's also because they are taking more and more importance and this, um, this poor people is getting stronger and, and angry because of this situation and we should be worried about that. Um, and that I, I think it, this is how fear of transformation was a very important element to create the first, uh, uh, the Royal Commission for um, uh, workers' uh, housing. And I think it, that is the point that I want to, 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 to connect with our situation now, um, more than 100 years later, where um, uh, Chilean cities uh, in, uh, in, the, in the middle of uh, 20th centuries, they were um, again uh, receiving a lot of uh, people from rural areas to cities. We, for decades, uh, also hundreds of years, our cities were very small, but in the in, in 19th century, we were receiving a lot of uh, people in our cities and our cities that were they were growing and again we were following um international rules that the, were the, the designing and planning our cities with these rings and green belts as uh, as uh, british and european and, and german cities and this second influence it was very important to give the main structure of the, our cities um, and Santiago is a good example of that and the other uh, uh, that that plan is from 1960 the same year um, of the major earthquake in history of 9.5 this is another um, very characteristic uh, very important characteristic of Chile that we 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 have a lot of earthquake we are we have a lot of different um, natural disasters the other important crisis was um, 
after the popular unity unity government of agenda where we were living a very interesting process of transformation where again the elite the the the, 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 the was very worried about this uh, transformation but at the same time um the this um uh, government uh, was uh, with a lot of hope of transformation that was uh, in this uh, new government in 1970 um, was after 10 years of a lot of very strong um, social movement in Chile and also in other parts of the world. But everything changed with the coup d'etat in 1973 and we were living other period of fear. Um, but at the same time, uh, uh, with a very strong transformation, with uh, we were living this uh, Chilean miracle of uh, creating this uh, neoliberal experiment, which were we have to say we were growing a lot. We were um, uh, from to be a, a very to be a very poor uh, country to have almost the highest. Uh, uh, um, wealthy rate in South America, but the main problem that we were growing economically, with, with, but at the same time, with a very unequal society. You can see here how um, unequal is our as our society, um, even more than the United States, and we were accumulating. Um, uh, um, all these problems for several years even we were growing and we were the most stable country in south america the problem was underneath uh, there were a lot of underlying conditions of this unequal society and 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 in october of 2019 we live a huge social outbreak um, against the model it was very interesting because it was a ex urban explosion um, we had some demonstration before in small uh, uh, dimensions, but here we leave a huge explosion, destroying public spaces, infrastructure, um, because uh, people were tired, tired of the model, not tired of one specific policy. They were tired of the, of the complete system this destruction um, was also connected with um, the fear of the lead for this transformation. And at the same time, the fear of the whole society to have a new coup d'etat. That was very interesting because this, this explosion was so powerful, but at the same time with a lot of fear, of fear for everybody from the from the uh, the the people that were they were living the coup d'etat in the 70s and their military regime worried about to have it again but at the same time a lot of hope to transformate the, the society you can see here to the left side a huge demonstration of uh, 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 when one week later the explosion and with a lot of um, public demonstration, this is a, a very famous um, expression of uh, uh, where women they were um, talking about the 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 um, the, um, the problem that women had been living here uh, is a is a is a is a the feminist uh, movement has been growing a lot. This movement is also um, creating a, a, a more global movement um, because the problems here of women are almost the same everywhere, and and I think it's now we this situation is always um, being. Uh, recognize at the same problems um, we had been living before. Um, these underlying conditions of this unequal society was also being recognized uh, during the coronavirus crisis uh, because 
poorer areas has been more affected in the same way that before. Even the 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 the, the, the first people um, uh, uh, sick were from the richer areas. The most affected area areas has been the poor areas. And again, we have been living this um, overlapping uh, crisis because um, is the same problem. You know, is a uh, poor people is suffering for social condition, for economic, for, for economic, economic conditions. And also when we have uh, these uh, natural disasters is again, the same people who is uh, suffering. That is why um, I think it was interesting to talk to you how these different crises has been the kind of exercises for us to, to be worried about these underlying conditions and how we need to be working, and I think as a planners, to transform these underlying conditions to be prepared for, for next um, uh, crisis. That is my presentation. Thank you very much. I will go to, to jump, give me, uh, to, to go to Gareth. Garth? Yes, yes. I believe I am here and uh, sharing my screen. I'm going to send it now into um, slideshow mode for it you. It looks great and you sound great. All right. Good, good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christine and Mark, uh, for inviting me to make this presentation. And, and thanks to my uh, two co presenters. And I think what I will have to say. Uh, is quite different than the other two presentations, but also fits very well within them. Um, I can explain a little bit the difference of the titles uh, from from uh, beforehand when it was West Africa to now it being um, East Africa. And that has to do with the fact that uh, the original speaker was Francis Wusu, who's a professor of uh, uh, urban planning from Iowa State. And uh, he was unfortunately unable to speak. And so he asked me to replace him. Uh, Francis's expertise is in West Africa, my expertise is in East Africa, but we often write together. And in fact, uh, this is a, a talk that is based around the paper on uh, planning in Anglophone Sub-Saharan Africa uh, with case studies coming from uh, Ghana, Tanzania, and Kenya. And I'll be talking today about uh, the Kenya focus and specifically uh, Nairobi. Uh, one of the things about Sub-Saharan Africa in general that makes uh, the planning history important uh, and, and unique in some respects is that uh, colonialism has had such an important effect. Uh, colonialism in the formal sense for most of Sub-Saharan Africa lasted only from the 1880s until the 1960s, uh, but that coincides with the rise of professional uh, urban planning. And so many of the cities of, uh, of great prominence in Africa were planned during the colonial era or were completely transformed uh, by uh, colonial planning. Uh, and that means that from the time period of independence onwards, there's been a struggle to assert an African identity to cities and to the practice of urban planning. Uh, that uh, struggle met head on with uh, massive public debts, enforced uh, structural adjustment plans, which are called SAPs, uh, with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, and a prolonged economic crisis that stretched through the 1970s and 80s and 90s. In the, uh, in the 21st century, one of the things that I'll talk about is uh, a return that we see to uh, a state-led uh, form and, and national state-led uh, form of, of planning, especially emphasizing uh, the blueprint master planning, which had gone out of fashion in the 70s and 80s in Africa. And, um, and a sort of contradictory situation where on the one hand, there's an increasing flow of investment to Africa uh, prior to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so you have FDI, foreign direct investment coming from a diversity now of, of, uh, of countries around the world. And, uh, and also private investment, not just state uh, aid and state uh, planning uh, 
investments, but private companies investing in urban development, um, both in, in the real estate sector and in creating new satellite uh, towns. Um, at the same time, there's been this per persistence of poverty in urban areas and increasing uh, levels of poverty in many cities across the region, um, coupled with uh, a, a persistence of informality, um, at, which in planning terms means uh, informal settlements predominate in many cities across the region. Uh, and the, the planning profession on the continent has been asking, is there something we can call an Afropolitan alternative? Or are there ways in which planning can, uh, can move past the colonial legacy and at the same time incorporate some of the ingenuity that exists in informal settlements. Um, and I'm gonna sort of question some of that. Uh, as I said, I'm gonna focus in on Nairobi, which is the capital and the largest city in Kenya. It's estimated according to the census in 2019 to have 4.4 million people. Most people would say it has many more people than that uh, because census uh, counts, undercount, uh, populations living in informal settlements. Uh, Kenya has gone through a tremendous amount of change in the period since its independence in 1963, um, and Nairobi has grown dramatically and it's also uh, been transformed. So I'm going to talk through some of the, the planning history of, of Kenya and of Nairobi as a, as a kind of sample of, uh, of planning across the region of, of Anglophone Africa. Um, and I divide this chronologically, and the first uh, period of time is the uh, period I'm calling the establishment of colonial uh, urban planning. And this was a time when there really wasn't a lot of professional planning in Africa, the time that the historians referred to as the scramble for Africa, uh, roughly from the 1880s. In 1884, 85, there was a conference in Berlin called the Berlin Conference that uh, had the, uh, the European powers dividing the continent uh, amongst themselves uh, with, with no input from, from Africa and all of the continent except for uh, Liberia and Ethiopia was taken over uh, by European rulers. Um, but it was a, a scramble because they were establishing their control uh, through until uh, World War I broke out and a significant amount of World War I was also fought in Africa. Uh, so it's not until after World War I is over um, that we come into the next period. Uh, for, for East Africa, uh, the British and the Germans more or less divided things, and what, uh, what the British were most interested in is something that they eventually called uh, the Uganda Protectorate, which is today's Uganda. And in between the Indian Ocean and, uh, and Uganda was a territory they gave over to the British East Africa Company, which they call the East Africa Protectorate that only became Kenya in 1920 as a colony. Um, there was very little professional planning that happened there. They did, the company had to establish administrative towns. And then in 1895, the uh, company handed over control to the colonial office. And um, the colonial office quickly made the decision that the provisional capital at uh, the port of Mombasa, which is over a thousand years old, uh, would have to change. They built a railway line uh, to Uganda. It was called the Uganda Railway for a reason. That was what they were really interested on in, um, and began a, a program of white settlement, bringing settlers from uh, all over Europe, but primarily from England itself, uh, to develop farming in uh, the highland areas of, of the East Africa Protectorate uh, to pay for the railroad. That was their objective. And they placed a new capital in the middle of the railway line uh, in a swampy plain, and that's what became uh, Nairobi, the place of cool waters is, is, is the name of the place uh, in 1901. Um, so it was after World War I that you have uh, the formalization of urban planning in much of, of Africa, not just in, in East Africa, and um, the interwar years between World War I and World War II uh, saw an establishment of colonial rule and together with that, the professionalization of planning. So Nairobi, even though it had been around for more than 25 years, uh, got its first formal plan uh, under the leadership of, of an architect by the name of Walton Jameson uh, in 1926. It was really about establishing segregation. And so the, the plan segregated uh, and segmented the city into uh, zones for, for, for whites and, and blacks and, and Asians. There were very small areas for Asians and very small areas for Africans. 
Um, they had one designated neighborhood that was predating 1926. It was called Pumwani. Um, and, uh, and they did small scale plans for different neighborhoods. Uh, but colonialism in Kenya operated under what was called the Kipande system. A Kipande is a pass. Uh, so all Africans had uh, the right to live in the city of Nairobi only if they were employed in Nairobi and their employers gave them a pass that they carried around their necks that was signed by the employer. Otherwise they could be deported from the city and they had no legal right of residence. Um, and so it was very similar to what uh, became famous much later after 1948 in, in South Africa as the apartheid system. Um, uh, that being said, uh, one of the really striking features of the period of the interwar years is that it established a pattern that continues where formal plans don't really get implemented very effectively. And instead what happens is that the, the ordinary people kind of reframe the city. Uh, so in a, the inframing tactics of the colonial rulers uh, get overturned and instead um, uh, uh, what became eventually called informality uh, per, uh, becomes the primary means of living. So there were a great many people in Nairobi who did not have a legal right to be there, uh, but the colonial regime didn't get rid of them because they couldn't. It was too much of a, of a volume. Um, after World War II, uh, colonialism had, a, had a, a very dramatic shift across the continent that the historians uh, Anthony Lowe and, and John Lonsdale called the second colonial occupation. So in the first colonial occupation, of course, you have the establishment of colonial rule. But the second colonial occupation was about uh, winning over the hearts and minds of the colonized people with the recognition that um, the colonies were going to be gaining independence. It was no longer tenable. It was financially uh, unacceptable in, in the home countries of France and Britain, which controlled most of, of Africa. Um, and it flew in the face of the call for freedom and human rights that they were leading in the rest of the world to continue to rule um, Africa. And so the inframing ideologies were there in place, but the idea was to give an answer in bricks and mortar uh, to the colonized people to say, hey, we're here, to, we're here to help and you shouldn't go join the Soviet Union and, and become a uh, communist. Uh, so they were much more in favor of nationalist leaders than of communist leaders. And in planning terms, that meant that the plans were finally thorough and comprehensive and actually involved um, trying to meet the needs of the African majorities of cities. In Nairobi uh, was a, a planner by the name of by the name, he's an architect by the name of L.W. Thornton White, who was um, actually coming from Cape Town in South Africa, but he was an English planner and wrote the first true master plan for Nairobi in 1948. Um, again, uh, much of it was not implemented. The uh, colonial apologist, uh, white settler uh, writer, um, Elspeth Huxley uh, even said, you know, they made, a, they made the best of a bad plan uh, with the 1948 plan. Um, and even so, uh, even though the, the, the Mau Mau emergency and the, the, the war for independence uh, took over any instances of planning in 1952, um, it did lead to the establishment of building rules and land use codes, zoning that remain in force uh, in many parts of Kenya and, and the same sort of process happened in Tanzania. Um, and I took this picture in 1982 when I was an undergraduate uh, at the university, uh, at St. Lawrence University, studying in Nairobi. And if you look closely, you see it's the ordinance for the rules for the park, which is the central park of the city of Nairobi uh, to this day, Uhuru Park. Uh, and the bylaws are written in 1961, and they're still the rules for how you're supposed to behave. And those are rules that come straight from uh, master planning uh, in London in the 1940s. Um, so there were some surprising continuities that existed after Kenya got its independence in 1963. Um, and and that the main continuity was that it really continued to be the case that uh, professional planning locked out uh, the voices of the majority. After independence in 1963, Kenya uh, very quickly became, although it remained technically a parliamentary democracy, it very quickly became a single party state. Um, and from 1963, 
until 2002, uh, no other political parties really had any capacity to contest uh, elections. And for a certain period in the 1980s, absolutely against the law to be a part of any other party. Uh, and so uh, there was a lot of disenfranchisement of, of people with uh, estimates vary, but something around 40% uh, of the population at the very least has always lived in, um, in informal settlements in Nairobi. Uh, but the uh, post-independence period also gave rise to uh, a great deal of effort to, to sort of provide an imprint on the city that would make it different, that would express the national identity. Uh, the most famous building in the city, uh, the Kenyatta International Conference Center, uh, designed by Kenyan architects, uh, manifests this because you see in uh, in its detail both the uh, the dining hall at the base and in the the rooftop uh, vestiges of uh, the African rondavel, a, a circular hut, um, and um, this was a, a a point of pride for a long time. It was the tallest building in the city. I think it's the sixth. Uh, tallest building now, but it's still the iconic structure. Um, and while this this sort of top-down kind of planning continued to to predominate, uh, as I said, you had this huge uh, proportion of the population living in informal settlements, and um, and their means of of providing for themselves and deciding for themselves gave rise to Nairobi earning a reputation uh, by the 1970s as uh, as what's called a self-help city. Uh, because if people wanted plans done, they did it themselves. If people needed water, um, they banded together to get uh, water. Uh, some of this would happen through means of corruption, but hey, it got people water, it got people electricity, got people housing. And, and so this, this sort of bifurcation of sort of two different economies of a formal and an informal city uh, took hold. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning what we call SAPs, the structural adjustment programs, because uh, so many uh, plans went into place in, in Kenya and across uh, Africa to undo colonial legacies with sort of showcase big, big scale projects. Um, governments went into debt and they had very little means for paying back those debts. And so the World Bank uh, and the International Monetary Fund stepped in and kind of transformed um, the nature of the economy uh, with a, a rollback in the, in the role of the state, uh, an effort to, to uh, turn to neoliberalism and privatization of everything, um, and uh, to try to overcome the failures in, in urban service provision. But in fact, in many cases, uh, this process made them worse. Um, master plans were kind of abandoned, and instead you have a, a rise of small-scale sectoral plans. And this coincided um, in the 1980s, with the the most rapid period of, of growth that had been that had happened since the the immediate burst after independence, so you have the skyrocketing growth of Nairobi, and uh, and skyrocketing in capacity to do any planning. So informal settlements uh, mushroomed. Uh, the most famous, probably the most famous informal settlement in Africa, uh, is called Kibera. You see in in the picture there, um, it's just a few square miles large. It has 14 different villages within it, each one sort of with its own identity and its own uh, connection to different uh, ethnicities within Kenya, often uh, quite hostile to one another within within the settlement, um, and, and sort of manifesting the injustices that are so palpable in Nairobi. You can see in the background um, what was uh, the whites only area of, of Nairobi uh, under colonial rule and uh, the country club the golf course uh, right next door. Um, so the 21st century has has been a roller coaster ride across the continent, um, and it's full of a lot of a lot of exciting opportunities. It's often referred to as the era of the African Renaissance um, because so many African countries turned towards multi-party democracy, and many countries had successful bursts of uh, gross domestic product growth. Um, frequently tied to uh, resource extraction. Um, but uh, this, this roller coaster has been at the same time with a whole series of crises. Many of the, the crises of the 1980s and 90s didn't, didn't simply go away. Um, and they sort of clash with, with the notion of a renaissance. Um, we have this return to, to master planning, often with, uh, with the, the planners themselves coming from uh, a different roster of countries than previously. 
uh, we're behind the master plans. So it's not necessarily British or American or Canadian planners in East Africa. It may be planners coming from, from Turkey or China um, or Japan, but it's still uh, a, a, a broad scale state-led master planning. And at the same time, you have uh, companies coming in, uh, probably most uh, famously Chinese and Russian companies to build um, satellite cities and sort of what we call privatopias. Um, this is all tied to, to what others have called the, the new scramble for Africa, sort of return to uh, attention from uh, around the world towards Africa's uh, resource base. Um, at the same time, uh, cities in Africa, and you see this very clearly in Nairobi, um, have continued to have a high degree of poverty, uh, extreme inequality, uh, a great de deal of deprivation and uh, significant uh, marginalization. Um, what uh, I hope to point out is that there's also a, a, a real turn towards alternatives. And in places like Kibera, you see organizations working uh, from the grassroots on up, whether it's a, a company that existed for, for a number of years, it was called Echo Toilet, uh, that was a private firm built from the community, building toilets uh, that people paid to use. But it was an extraordinary achievement to have uh, an increase in, in the presence of, of sanitation in the neighborhood. Uh, or something like uh, uh, Carolina for Kibera or um, the Konkui Design uh, Initiative, uh, KDI, working in Kibera and improving the quality of life. So a lot of the planning has come from the pop popular sector rather than from the public sector, meaning the government, or from uh, the, 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 the private sector more properly. Um, to the extent that there's been uh, alternative sort of private sector development, it's been both these privatopias and um, an increasing number of entrepreneurs within uh, informal settlements, uh, densifying the settlement you see in the picture here, uh, increasing numbers of, of what often get called tenements being built uh, instead of, of small uh, single family homes in the midst of places like Kivera. Um, the 21st century has also brought an, an amazing um, initiative and in planning. Kenya went through a constitutional reform. 2010 is the date of approval of a, of a really innovative constitution that gives a lot more uh, power to uh, what are now called counties in Kenya. They abolished uh, provinces and changed all of the uh, pre previously called districts into counties and even added a couple of counties and a, a much higher level of democratization down to the local levels. Um, even though there's been a continuation of uh, authoritarian and top-down orientation, uh, it's a very highly, hotly contested time. There's been a lot of political violence in the 21st century, uh, most especially after the 2007 elections carrying over into 2008. Um, but in planning terms uh, coming up within that 2008 period, uh, a, a master plan called Nairobi, Nairobi Metro 2030, uh, which as you see in the subtitle calls a world-class African metropolis. And there's a lot of ambition to this plan uh, to expand uh, the metro area beyond the county to see all the way down to the Tanzanian border on the, the, the map of the plan itself. Its most tangible impacts have been in transport. It's been a tremendous uh, expansion in public transport and in, in, in private transport in terms of, of road building. Um, one of the planners uh, for the city of Nairobi said to me, uh, this highway you see here, the Thika Superhighway, um, was, had just opened. And he said, you know, the Chinese have, have addressed the tremendous needs that we've had in this city for years that the colonial regime didn't address and the post-colonial regime did not address. And so the Chinese build. And then he looked at me and he said, but they just build. They don't really think about where they're building. They don't think about the fact that this is a democracy and uh, you can't just plow down houses and, and put a highway in. So there's a lot of tension within this, uh, this plan and its implementation highlighted by the, the, inc the incredible inequalities that exist in, in income um, and disparities that are manifested in uh, the booming growth of, of shopping malls all over Nairobi and at the same time, the continued squalor of informal settlements. Um, transport really manifests this. You have the plan kind of dreaming of a, of a subway network and instead uh, what most people utilize to get around are what are called matatu, um, which are minibuses often exceedingly overcrowded. Uh, but the plan has led to a regularization 
of the the matatu roots and an even uh, you know an effective map of of where people can can catch matatus thinking beyond nairobi seeing nairobi as a as a uh, a hub for the entire east african region uh, they have completed uh, under Chinese uh, construction a, a standard gauge railway phase one from Nairobi to Mombasa. What you see on this map, the, the idea of making uh, Nairobi a hub throughout the whole region. And it may or may not happen. Part of that has to do with the context of the continued uh, contestation of, of electoral politics. Uh, I put these two maps here. I'm a political geographer, so I, I inevitably am interested in this. But the maps show you that Nairobi, in both of the last two elections, and uh, also in the 2008 election that I don't have a map for here, uh, the opposition actually won uh, Nairobi County and uh, and lost barely in the, in the nation as a whole. And in 2008, um, the 2007 election, the uh, the results were extremely dubious, and it's likely that the opposition actually did win the election. So Nairobi is the center of it. You see all around Nairobi, you have uh, the ruling party winning, but Nairobi itself goes to the opposition. So it's a very politically divided city. Um, and I'd, I'd like to end by just stressing how I think it's important to see Nairobi is connected to the world, um, because so often, as, as, it, as we find in African studies, that uh, especially in the United States, uh, people look at Africa as someplace else and something different, and its cities must not really be cities. Uh, and they're not really uh, a part of our story in the history of planning in the world. Uh, and these are images that really showcase uh, the um, the worldliness and the uh, the Americanness of Nairobi. Uh, on the bottom left, uh, you see the Nyayo Monument, the the Footsteps Monument. If you look closely, you see. Uh, the raising of the flag of Kenya, which is a direct copy of uh, the Iwo Jima Memorial uh, in DC. And the, the Nyayo Monument itself, of course, is very similar to uh, the Washington Monument, and this is no accident. Uh, and the bottom right is the memorial to uh, the, this is the site of the bombing of the United States Embassy in 1998, um, which somehow or other many people in the United States forget uh, but people in Kenya don't forget at all. And uh, it's the, the date of that bombing is as memorable and notorious for Kenyans uh, as September 11th for Americans. Um, and then the UN has its second headquarters in the world uh, beyond New York in Nairobi. Um, so it is very much a capital of the world. And then uh, lastly, the, the photo on top showing you, um, you know, a skate park of, of uh, inline skates um, around a circle in downtown Nairobi, spontaneously created. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a city that has all the range of things that we see in many American cities of hipsters and hip hop and uh, a, a, a cultural vibrancy that belies all the, the sorts of inequalities that I've been talking about. Um, and I'll stop there. Now, I'm going to change presenter back to Mark. Mark, don't forget to unmute yourself. Thank you. I think you re-muted yourself again. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay. Um, let me turn on my camera as well. Um, so I, I think we've uh, gone around the whole planet and um, there, there are a lot of common themes that I think each one of the speakers has talked about with respect to, I, I think, almost universality of planning, um, specifically how each city or each country is unique and has unique history. There's the common thread of uh, colonial history, the tension between rich and poor, urban and rural, local and national control, and um, authoritarian versus democracy, and most recently kind of 
the shared envi environmental challenges that each one of these three countries um, face. And with that, uh, Christine, I guess we can start with Q and A. Uh, as um, hopefully we still have enough time to get through a few questions. Yeah, um, we, we do have a couple that have come through. Folks, uh, feel free to type your questions in uh, and we'll see if we can get to them. Um, okay, this one is for Hong. I got a couple for you actually. Um, in December 2020, the communist government returned some confiscated properties to the Catholic Church in appreciation for their help to fight COVID-19. Do you foresee other lands being returned to former landowners under a government-sponsored reward system in the future? I don't see, <clears throat> first of all, I don't see why that could not happen um as to the specific specificity of it who i think would be beneficial to it that's not in my expertise so i wouldn't be comfortable enough disclosing it but uh just from my experience uh, with how the government works um change can happen very quickly sometimes under the radar as well and so uh, especially for me living overseas can be hard to just to keep up with current events that are happening at home, um, even if um, you know the news sources can just be one of the avenues. I just have to ask people on the ground, but um, I don't see why it would not happen. Um, so, okay, this is another one for you and folks. It looks like a couple people are doing the raise their hand function um type your questions in the chat box because we don't have sound enabled for all of you thank you um so this one is also for you hong i believe vietnam also places restrictions on who can own land and limits foreign born from purchasing property can you elaborate on this and if you feel this type of protectionism has been a benefit to development or a hindrance and i guess maybe after hong responds our other panelists can respond with their respective countries as well yeah, I know that um, when I, maybe 10, 15 years ago, foreigners were, uh, there were a lot of restrictions placed on foreigner in terms of owning land, owning property, and as well as starting a business in Vietnam. So how that worked out was that you would have to partner with um, uh, Vietnamese nationals. And so uh, I believe in recent years, it has made it easier for foreigners to um, own property, uh, land, <clears throat> land technically is owned, all, always owned by the government. Um, land is for the people, it's set in the constitution. So technically it's not a private property to be owning land, but for, in terms of like able to utilize it in a way that to make businesses, it has been made easier. <clears throat> uh, I believe you just have to check the, check the local regulations on that. And in terms of I would say protectionist policy, uh, as I mentioned earlier, because the government is still very new and um, the country was still in the process of adapting to the modern system, um, I think that makes sense in how uh, the government would choose to go with that policy. And personally, it, I think it's depending on the, the different uh, uh, cases as well. So um, I hope that answer your questions. Thank you. Um, are there any other, um, in your other respective countries, Garth, let's maybe start with you about restrictions on uh, who owns land and, and limits for those that are foreign born? Uh, yes, there are. And um, I, I suppose I'm, I'm more familiar in this particular instance with Tanzania um, that um, uh, foreign owners, uh, first of all, all land is government land. And so you are only given um, a right of occupancy. Um, and usually it's a 99 year uh, right of occupancy. And um, no foreigner can have that. Um, so you, you have to have a partner in the local uh, in the local community, uh, you can have something on the order of forty nine percent 
um, capacity. The exception to that is in tourism, uh, where you can rent the land. Um, and so a lot of uh, large, large tourist hotels um, in Tanzania rent the land from the government. Um, and those land rents for the government of Zanzibar, for example, those land rents are essential to the to the functioning of literally to the functioning of uh, the uh, Department of Urban Planning. Uh, they just couldn't they wouldn't have any money <laughs> to operate without the land rents. Um, but yes, yeah, so there are a lot of restrictions on uh, on ownership. Um, and the, the other thing that's important about this, and this is true for Kenya and Tanzania, is that uh, land markets are are so skewed. It's impossible to really um, uh, underscore this enough that the colonial regimes never established a uh, land registry. And so uh, the cadastral surveys were in, incomplete. And so to, to certify who owns what is impossible. And um, you have overlapping claims. And I've seen in, in where I did my dissertation in Zanzibar, um, three different ways in which someone legitimate, legitimately lays claim to a property in a city. And so when you try to establish a real estate market <laughs> and someone saying this land was uh, you know, given to my ancestors by God under a walk dedication because my ancestors were uh, the slaves of the owner of this property and no one can take this away from me. And then you have someone else coming and saying, you know, my uh, my ancestors rented this property, um, and uh, and someone else saying, you know, I'm I'm the government, and all land is government land. So um, if we want to redevelop this, so be it. And so this sort of uh, overlap is very common in Kenya and Tanzania and Uganda uh, between uh, indigenous land rights, uh, in some cases, historic ruler's rights uh, in Uganda, that's especially the case. Um, and then uh, customary rights, colonial uh, governmental rights, and then uh, religious rights and, and private property. So it's just, it's just a mess. There's nothing more of a mess in Africa than, than land control. Most countries have established their own land courts separate from uh, the court system just to handle this. Wow. Okay. Uh, Roberto, can, can you speak to Chile? Oh, looks like you're muted. Um, let's see here. Let me see if I can help you. Looks like you're self muted. No, there you are. There yes, you are. Thank you. I okay. Just work yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, even, even, 54% of the of the of the land in Chile is public is uh is quite concentrated in 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 natural uh, areas is uh but the thing is Chile is a very 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 um, liberal neoliberal country and and it is everything is privatized is uh even water is private uh uh all the services are private, and of course, if we are ever very open to to the foreign investment uh, for for decades. In some ways, it's good for the services, but of course, it's a huge problem. And everything related with the social outbreak was connected with this. Is a uh, um, the only area where it's different is Easter Island. Easter Island is has a special law and also now has a new law. <laughs> we have the law for Easter Island where you, the, the, the owner is the is the government and the indigenous uh, communities. Uh, but now there is a new law uh, for the control of residents where it's actually a very interesting thing. We I have been doing research for more than 10 years there and also we develop a current capacity model to control population to control the balance between people and and um and uh, the management of resources of course for the coronavirus period which has been very difficult because it's a mainly a uh, touristical uh, place and now is everything closed and it, it has been 
is difficult. But I have to say that now, because of this social outbreak, we will be uh, voting in one month for a new constitution. We will be have a, we will be electing 50% women and 50% men to rewrite the constitution, and 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 I think is now is a kind of white paper because everything is in discussion about the, the how we will be dealing with the water with land and now we have been living a huge crisis of housing we will also dealing with uh, the, the the social deficit the, the social housing deficit quite well for several years but now we have a huge increase of this problem and i and one of the main problems is the is the is the provisional land, especially because the system is quite controlled for the private sector. I think it, um, the, the, the 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 population is asking for a more powerful state and even controlling some kind of the housing market and the and the and the land market. Um, Roberto, could you? Speak dig a little bit deeper into the housing crisis as you see it in Chile. Um, obviously in the US, we are also experiencing a great housing shortage, particularly at least in my neck yeah. of the woods, uh, workforce housing, for example, or you know, affordable housing. Um, and we're doing a lot of work to try to adjust our zoning regulations uh, to meet more the the dense the density demand that we need yeah. versus you know large lot zoning can you can you just dig a little bit deeper in in what your housing crisis looks like yes uh, I, I, I have to say that when democracy started in 1990 the 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 the, the level of poverty was 45 percent and and the the um, the per capita income was around um uh i, I think that um uh was five thousand dollars per capita now we are twenty five thousand and the percentage of people under the line of, of poverty is 12 13 you know it's, it's a huge transformation uh, and 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 the the main drivers of the economy was to to be rich and to decrease Poverty and and the main tool was housing policies, and the model was giving a voucher, and to everybody almost, <laughs> for around between thirty thirty five thousand dollars, as a gift. You know, it's amazing. It's something, and we were happy <laughs> because we were building a lot of houses. But this voucher. Is a kind of, is is a, is 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 tricky because it's mainly money from to the private sector, you know, because people is is happy because he's having this voucher, but they cannot really choose for a good house, and um, but anyway that was good in some way, but we were accumulating a big stock of houses, but with bad quality and bad locations, and this is why. People were so furious <laughs> because they had a house, but we don't, it's not really valuable. That is one thing. And we were decreasing the slams for several years. Almost in 2007, we were almost eliminating the deficit. But we didn't know about these underlying conditions of quality and we were accumulating problems accumulating problems because a lot of people they didn't want to go to live in the in the periphery because most of the new houses were in the periphery and people decided to, to don't receive this voucher of thirty thousand dollars it's very interesting because they prefer to stay living in in the uh, in in overcrowded houses but with better location and since more or less 2010 we also starting to receive a lot of immigrants and now we have a huge explosion of uh islams and 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 uh and the and this uh housing shortage it has been increasing and we we need to change the model you know it's not enough 
this voucher. We need to to go to rental, different kind of rentals, and I think that is is the shorter way I can explain that. Um, Garth, can or Hong, can you either of you speak to the in the two minutes we have left? uh it into uh, the I, what i assume is to be a housing crisis uh in areas that you're familiar with garth maybe do you want to take sure. that first? i can do quickly uh i think that um it's very similar to what uh, roberto was talking about and um what happens i think for the most part is um the, the government is is incapacitated for building sort of public housing um, and uh, private sector housing construction is skewed heavily towards luxury uh, buildings, whether it's apartments or, or these satellite cities. Um, and so the, the sort of in-between zone um, is that people people are, are lacking um, in, in housing in the, the sectors that need it the most. And uh, as I said, there's, a, there's an increasing number of um, uh, what, for lack of a better term, I would say are entrepreneurs who are building uh, apartment complexes that um, that look like you know th there's even a book that sort of makes the comparison to 19th century Berlin um, in in the informal settlements. Uh, so it increases the density, and they are higher quality structures than were there before. Um, but it is um, it's not it's still not enough to meet the de demands for housing, um, and so people end up living in uh, the the peripheries where they don't want to be. Yeah, for housing in Vietnam, it's very much of the domain within the informal economy where people are the main drivers of uh, their housing situation. Um, you can see more incidents of informal settlements closer to the metro periphery, um, which is very typical throughout the world, I would say. Um, and in, in those instances, the government have, do, have their uh, pro like housing projects um, however, it's not an at-large um, initiative in the country. And in terms of accommodating sort of new, the new workforce for industrialization, like industrial zones, um, planning to accommodate uh, industrial workers is part of um, sort of like that housing. So I wouldn't say Vietnam has um, much of a housing crisis as similar to the like United States or in Chile. Um, but there are definitely um, needs from especially communities who are not as socially or economically um, empowered. Hey, Christine, okay. do we yeah. have a quick minute for Garth you and Roberto to talk about their upcoming book? Yep. Roberto, why don't you go ahead? You were the one that noticed it first, so. <laughs> Yes, it's, uh, it's just um, we, uh, Michael Newman it was, uh, is, um, was the editor of a new book about regional design and is, uh, is a quite, quite interesting overview of different countries. I was lucky to write the article about Santiago, it's the only Latin American city in, in this book. And I think it would be a very interesting um, understanding of how uh, regional planning and and in the way how regional design Michael is talking is uh, is needed. You know, is uh, uh, is 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 not something different than the urban planning. I think that that is main thing. How we really need to think in multi-level planning and multi-level governance. I think that is is the way how. how um, we were trying to 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 put that approach and how everything is quite connected and 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 I have to say that now most of the problems that we have now as a country are quite connected with planning failures. Yeah, it's the same. My chapter is about Nairobi, and I think it's making a lot of the same points. And and I would end the same way you just did. <laughs> What's the name of the book? Re is Regional. Is regional design guideline uh, uh, um, something like that? Is is a I, I let me check. Is a is a give me give me I will I will. Is a handbook. Um, one second. Is ha well, while is you're Ravlich, oh, go ahead. The Ravlich handbook of regional design. 
Got yes, it. Routledge Handbook for Regional Design. Okay. From Routledge, obviously. Perfect. All right. Well, um, Hong and Roberto and Garth, thank you for joining us. Mark, Louis de Grace from the National Capital Area Chapter, thank you for putting this together along with the International Division. This is great. I was saying I love these kind of webcasts because I get to be nosy and kind of find out what's going on across the globe. Sometimes we just don't peek up from underneath our, our own nose. Um, this session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. To record those credits, head over to planning.org, log in your MyAPA account. From there, you can search either by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage. Uh, we'll also have a recording of this available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. And I think that's it. Uh, so everyone, again, thanks for joining. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk next time. Thanks, Christine. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank thanks, you. guys. Bye.